So this lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course about schemes. And in it, we will construct the etal space of a sheaf. So we introduced sheaves and pre-sheaves last lecture, and most people's initial impression on encountering sheaves is they seem to be a unnecessarily complicated and abstract way of talking about functions on a space. So I'll start by giving an example to show why we might want to work with um, sheaves rather than functions on a space. So on the left hand side, let's just look at the space of regular functions on the affine line. So we have polynomials over the complex numbers and the affine line Um, C just corresponds to the maximal ideals of this ring. So we recall that if you've got a point alpha in C, it just corresponds to the maximal ideal of all multiples of x minus alpha. And we have the Zariski topology, um, which says the open sets have a basis of sets df, which is the set of points where f is not equal to zero, f is some polynomial. And we also have the regular functions on each open set. So we have f of df is just all polynomials of the form g over f to the n. Uh, so all rational functions of this form. So these are the func rational functions that are regular on the set df. So f will have a finite number of zeros. The open set will be the complement of the zeros. And these are functions which are regular, except possibly for poles at those zeros. Now we can do the same for the ring of integers z. Um, so here, we're just going to sort of copy this. So instead of the affine line, well, we're going to take the set of maximal ideals. So we have the maximal ideals of two, three, five, and so on. So this is called the maximal spectrum of the integers. And as we will see later, it turns out to be the wrong thing to do. You should really take all prime ideals rather than maximal ideals, but that will be coming later. Anyway, we take the open sets, df, and here f is going to be an integer, and the open set is going to be the set of, of, of primes such that f is not in this prime ideal. Um, in other words, p does not divide f. So this is exactly what happened here. Um, the, the, the open set um, just corresponds to the point such that f isn't in the maximal ideal. And we're going to define FDF to be the set of rational numbers of the form G over F to the N, where G is some, some integer. So this is exactly analogous to this. So we're sort of pretending that an integer is a function on this space here. And there's a bit of a difference because here, a polynomial is a function on, on C taking so f has values in C at all points of C. Well, here it's a little bit more complicated because the, um, you might think of an integer as being a function on spec Z. And what's it taking values in? Well, well here, this is just the quotient C of x over the x minus a. So f naturally takes values in this field. Well, here the field is going to be z over p. So an integer is taking values in fields, but the field varies with the point. So it's a sort of funny sort of function. It's not taking values in a fixed space. It's taking values in a variable field. Actually, more generally, it'd be better to think of as taking values in a local ring rather than a field, but we won't worry about that quite now. And it also... Um, th this also satisfies the sheaf property. So in, in other words, it really, integers really are behaving as if they were functions. So for example, 
let's look at the points two, three, five, seven, and so on. And let's take a couple of open sets. So I might take an open set U1 here, and I might take an open set um, U2 here. And then um, F of U1 is equal to all functions or all, all integers of the form A over, um, well, we're allowed a power of two or three in it. So two to the something times three to the something. So we're only allowing twos and threes in the, in the denominator. And similarly, f of u2 is all functions where we allow twos and fives in the denominator. Sorry, all integers, not all functions. And now um, if, if we set um, u, that's u2, if we set u equals u1 union u2, well, this will be all things of the form uh, c over 2 to the something. And now the sheaf property says that if you've got a number of, um, in over this open set, so I suppose b over 2 to the something times 5 to the something has the same restriction to u intersection u1 as um, f of u as as some um, something in f of u1 then it has to come from um, some function on this set u in other words an integer with only twos in the denominators and that's kind of obvious if you've got an inter a rational number with only twos and fives in the denominator and it also has only twos and threes in the denominator then obviously it only has a two in the denominator so this is going to be if we've got this property, then it's of the form C over two to the something. So the sheaf property on this rather funny sheaf turns out to be this basic property coming from, I guess, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, and the point of this is you can now study the ring Z by thinking geometrically. You think of Z as being functions on a space. Well, obviously, for the ring Z, um, this isn't going to tell you anything very new about the integers because it's so well known. But for more complicated rings, this way of looking at the ring geometrically can be, can be very powerful. Um, so a basic theme of sheaves is that sheaves of sets are sort of very similar to behave in the same way as sets and similarly sheaves of abelian groups um, are very similar to abelian groups. So um, we've only defined sheaves of abelian groups. For, if you want to define sheaves of sets, you need to modify the definition very slightly, which we won't worry about because we're only going to use sheaves of sets as informal examples. Um, in particular, we can form a category of sheaves of sets and a category of sheaves of abelian groups. For these, we want to define morphisms from a sheaf U to a sheaf G. So a sheaf F to a sheaf G. So what's a morphism from a sheaf F to a sheaf G? Well, it's pretty obvious. What we should do is for each open set U, we should give a morphism from F of U to F of G. And moreover, these should be compatible with restriction maps. So if V is contained in U, then we have maps F of V to G of V. And we have these restriction maps, rho. And I'm not going to write rho U of V because I will get U and V the wrong way around. So um, a morphism consists of um, morphisms like this for each U such that this diagram commutes whenever V is contained in U. Um, so this makes sheaves into a category. We've got a set of objects and morphisms between them. So the, 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 the category of sheaves of sets over a space is behaves very much like the category of sets. It's a sort of weak model of set theory. 
it's not quite a model of set theory because things like the axiom of choice have a bit of a tendency to fail in it. Um, th 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 this is called a topos. Um, and there's a whole theory of toposes where the idea is you sort of do set theory, except instead of working with sets, you work with sheaves over a topological space or something like that. And similarly, sheaves of abelian groups that the category of sheaves of abelian groups is very similar to the category of abelian groups. And this is a sort of theme of sheaf theory that when you're studying sheaves of abelian groups, what you do is you try and think of some constructional theorem about abelian groups and extend it to sheaves of abelian groups. Um, so the first question is, what about exact sequences? So we might have an exact sequence, A goes to B goes to C goes to naught of abelian groups, which you remember means A is more or less a subgroup of B, and the quotient of B by A is more or less equal to C. So um, um, we want to do the same thing for sheaves. So what, what does it mean? for um, a, more, a, a, a sequence naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught of sheaves to be exact. Well, um, it's completely obvious. I mean, any idiot can figure out what the definition of this should be. All you do is you say naught goes to A of U, goes to B of U, goes to C of U, goes to naught, is exact for all U. I mean, this is a very natural definition, and there's no other obvious thing you could have, so this must be the correct definition, right? Well, actually, this is completely wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's just... Um, well, it's not completely wrong, it's half wrong, because that's okay for saying A goes to B is injective, but this gives you the wrong definition for saying the map from B to C is surjective, which is really quite surprising. I mean, it's very hard. If this isn't the right definition, it's not at all obvious what the right definition is. And understanding why this is wrong is really one of the fundamental um, things in sheaf theory. So we're going to um, look at an example to see why this is so wrong. So I'm going to take a space, I'm going to take my space X to be a circle. And I'm going to define two spaces. X1 is going to be the same as X. And X2 is going to kind of be a circle winding around it twice. And now I'm going to define a sheaf. F of X2 is the sections um, sorry, not f of x2. f2 of u is the sections from u to x2. In other words, if I've got an open set u, f2 of u is just going to be the, the maps from u to x2 that, that um, are sections. And similarly, f1 of u is the sections u goes to x1. And now we can see x2 goes to x1 is obviously on two. So we've got natural maps from x2 to x1 and um, x1 goes to x. Um, so we get a natural map from the sheaf f2 to the sheaf f1 in, in the obvious way. And we've also got a map from x1, x2 goes to x1. And this map here is obviously surjective. Um, and if we look at the maps of sheaves, well, f2 of x goes to f1 of x is not surjective. In other words, if you think about it, this is just a point, and this is empty, because there are no continuous maps from x 
to x2 that are sections of it. I mean, if you if you start by mapping this point up to here and go round, you find you you get back to the other point of x2. So 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 f2 of x is actually empty. Um, so well, we're talking about sheaves of sets rather than rather than sheaves of groups here, but um, we still have this problem that uh, we've got two different possible definitions of surjective. We can either talk about x2 to x1 being surjective, or we can talk about f2 of x goes to f2, 1 of x being surjective. And these are different. So this is a sort of um, local definition of being surjective. And this is a sort of global um, way to define things being surjective. So, so here, um, over each point of x, the fiber of this point of x2 to x1 is, is surjective. So we're sort of looking locally. If, if we just look locally at a point, then the corresponding um, maps of open sets would, would be surjective. And this is the global definition. And we need to know whether we should be using a local or a global definition of things being surjective. And it turns out that the right thing to do is to, is to work with a sort of local definition. Um, so how do we do that? Well, um, um, suppose we've got a, um, um, any map from A to X that, where, where this is continuous. Then we can form a sheaf by just letting f of u be the continuous sections from u to a. In other words, maps from u to a that um, such that if you take the map here and then project, you get back to where you started. And this is this is always a sheaf. So it's a sheaf of sets if a is is just a set, and it's a sheaf of groups if a has some reasonable um, group-like structure on its fibers. So we can construct a sheaf from any map from a set A to X. And similarly, if we've got a map from A to X and a map from B to X, and F is the sheaf of A and G is the sheaf of B, then if we've uh, got a map from A to B making this continuous, we get an induced map from the sheaf F to the sheaf G, again, in a fairly obvious way. Um, and we now have um, um, this concept. We can obviously talk about A to B being surjective. So A to B might be surjective. But... Um, f of x goes to g of x might not be. So this was um, just what we had in the previous example. Um, and um, what we want to do is sort of define the map from f to g to be surjective, if and only if the map from a to b is surjective. Well, there's a bit of a problem with this because if we're given a sheaf f, um, you know, it, doesn't necessarily come from a, um, a map A. So we have the following problem. Does a sheaf F come from um, a map from A goes to X for some A? And it turns out there's a, there's a very nice way to construct A from it. Um, in fact, this works for a pre-sheaf. Um, so we're now going to construct the et al space of a pre-sheaf F. Um, and uh, what we want to do is, um, get, given some space X, construct a space A mapping to it that has something to do with the pre-sheaf F. And first of all, suppose we're given a point X in X. We want to know what is the fiber of A over this point 
X. And um, we're going to construct it as follows. Point of the fiber is given by a section um, F of F of U for some, some neighborhood um, U of P. And um, we need to put it to, we need to say when these, we, these are the same. So F um, and G are the same point of the fiber. If F and G are the same near X. So what this means is that um, the image of F and G in um, the image of F and G in V are the same for some small V with, with P contained in V. So you can think of F uh, as being, um, so, so we have the point P here, the pictures, you get a point P here, and we've got a set U1 and F is in F of U1 and um, G is going to be in F of U2. And somewhere inside U1 and U2, we're going to take a small set V and F and G have to have the same restriction to the set V. And if so, they're considered to be the same point of the fiber. So if you think of this pre-sheaf as being continuous sections of something, then the fiber is roughly equivalence classes of sections where two things are considered equivalent if they're the same near P. Next, we have to put a topology on this. Um, So a base of open sets is given as follows. So, so suppose we're given any set F in F of U. Then um, we can form an open set um, for each P in U, we take the image of F in the fiber over P. And the union of these all images will be an open set. And these open sets will form a base of the topology. Um, so this gives us a set A to X, and this is called the et al space of the sheaf F. Um, and what does the, the, the word etal, um, a map from A to X is etal if for all A in A, um, there is a neighborhood or um, um, V of A such that the map from V to the image in X is a homeomorphism. So um, I'm not going to prove this um, because it's rather easy. And in fact, in sheaf theory, there's a whole lot of statements that are rather easy to prove just by unwinding the definitions. And I'm going to leave most such statements just as exercises. Um, so the definition of the fiber sort of says that each fiber is um, a direct limit over all the open sets of U, if you're used to doing direct limits. Um, um, now, the etal space can have a rather strange looking topology. You see it's locally isomorphic to X and that each point has a neighborhood that looks like X. However, this is a bit misleading. For example, if X is a manifold, say a, a real manifold, then this says that each point of A 
is also locally a manifold, so A is a manifold. Well, that's really misleading because it turns out that the, that the set A can be wildly non-Hausdorff. Um, so in the next lecture, we'll give some examples of what a tile spaces look like and just how strange they can be.